On my bookshelf at home are a stack of handwritten letters that I've received from Wayne over the last year and a half. He and I have never met, but what connects us is our shared love of language as writers. What separates us is that Wayne is in prison and has been since 1995. The last time Wayne was free, Coolio was topping the charts with Gangster's Paradise, Paul Rudd was making his movie debut in Clueless, and pagers were all the rage among teenagers like Wayne, who was only 17. I never imagined that I'd correspond with someone in prison, but then again, the last few years have been filled with events I'd never imagined happening. Like many others during the first year of the pandemic, I felt lost and isolated. There was so much suffering in the world, but very little I could do from the confines of my two bedroom apartment. So when an email arrived promoting a volunteer program to mentor incarcerated writers via snail mail, I took a deep breath and signed up. I've been teaching creative writing for 10 years, but it always bothered me that the only students I was helping were the ones that could afford it. I wanted to be able to help writers who didn't have access to my classes too. And if I was feeling isolated and lonely, I could only imagine what someone who was incarcerated felt like. I may have been living under restrictions I wasn't used to and apart from the people I loved, but it was nothing like being in prison. I still had my freedom to eat what I wanted, when I wanted, to access my phone, the internet, and information at any chance I wanted, to have privacy, space, and peace, and so much more. But I did know what it felt like to be lonely and invisible. I lived alone, worked from home, and was not seeing friends or family. So I often wondered, if something happened to me, how long would it take for someone to realize it? A few days, a week, longer? Would it be before or after my cats had eaten my face? <laughs> In January 2021, I received Wayne's name and mailing address, along with a list of do's and don'ts for, for critiquing incarcerated writers. Number one, be nurturing and supportive. Share what you like about their writing and encourage them to keep doing it. No problem there, I'm a writing teacher. Number two, acknowledge your own privilege and blind spots that might hinder your ability to fully relate to their experience. This one would definitely be harder. I lived a pretty sheltered, white, upper middle class life, minus one 24 hour stint in jail for a DUI in my mid 20s. I worried I'd unwittingly say something offensive or insensitive. Number three, don't judge them for their offenses. This was the one I was most worried about. We've all made mistakes, but once I knew what Wayne's crime was, I would never be able to unknow it. And I worried that that would hinder my ability to connect with him. And finally, rule number four, don't be elitist. This rule seemed really important, but also impossibly vague. Sure, I could avoid complaining about the rising cost of avocado toast and the oat milk shortage at my favorite coffee shop, but I worried that part of being elitist was not knowing you were doing it. I also had some decisions to make regarding how we would correspond. I could either use my real name or a fake name. I also had to choose whether to use my home address or a PO box. Despite fears for my safety as a woman who lives alone, my gut reaction was to be transparent with Wayne. It seemed impossible to build a relationship without it. But I didn't want to be naive either. As much as I didn't want to have any preconceived biases or judgments, I ended up Googling Wayne. What I found was that Wayne had been convicted of murder. I was immediately struck by both fear and doubt about what I'd gotten myself into. He was now in his early 40s and had been denied parole several times. He would be up for parole again in just two years. I worried that if he got out, he might come looking for me. I decided I would use my real name, but also a PO box. The next step was to write my first letter, 
which would be a surprise to Wayne. I had been randomly matched with him from a list of incarcerated people who had entered PEN America's annual prison writing contest. So this wasn't a program he'd signed up for. Instead, he was receiving a letter from a stranger offering to mentor him, his consolation prize for sending his work out into the world. I knew the importance of the first letter, so I typed up what I wanted to say on my laptop first. Then I pulled out the lined, rainbow-colored stationery I had bought for just this purpose in an attempt to bring a pop of color and beauty <laughs> to an environment generally devoid of it and wrote out my letter by hand. I hoped these choices would reveal to him a little bit more about who I was and that he, in turn, might feel more comfortable revealing himself to me. When I was finished, I made sure to avoid the big no-nos for prison mail. No staples or paper clips, which could be used as weapons. No stamps, which could be used as currency. No sexually explicit material, which could be used as a reminder that women existed. <laughs> and absolutely no glitter. It could be used to traffic narcotics into the prison. I had no idea if Wayne would welcome my letter, reject it, or ignore it. About a month later, I received a response written in jagged handwriting in black ink on two pages of lined notebook paper, front and back. He began, Janelle, it was wonderful to get your letter. Thank you so very much for reaching out to me. I breathed a sigh of relief that my letter had been welcomed versus dismissed. As I read on, I learned that Wayne was involved with a nonprofit that provides programming in the prison and had curated a TED Talk series for which he coached his fellow prisoners. He wrote, I wear the badge of the Simon Cowell of this prison with pride. <laughs> I encourage a lot, but will always be honest. Wayne's personality came through clearly in his writing. There were lots of underlines, parenthetical asides, exclamation points, and self-deprecating humor. He was obviously excited to have another writer to communicate with. He closed his letter with, OK, for not writing fiction, this is turning into a novel. Again, thank you for offering a look at some of my work. Can't wait to hear from you again. It had been a while since I'd heard a man say that to me. <laughs> Initially, Wayne and I stuck to lighter topics in our letters. Our garden finished sending veggies to the community, he wrote. We shipped out a little over 7,200 pounds, which could be more impressive if you knew some of it was stuff like shard and peppers. Personally, I have a black thumb, so I was surprised to learn that Wayne had the tenderness and patience to nurture living things that I didn't. Other things I learned. Brussels sprouts are a cold weather crop you knock the snow off of when you harvest them. Prisoners only have access to gardening tools for a limited period due to, in Wayne's words, a long bureaucratic reason. And gardening helps him write. Two to four hours a day in the garden will help even more words flow out of me somehow. One of the mysteries of life, he wrote. Wayne routinely asked me about the meanings of literary words that he came across, like ekphrastic and MacGuffin, which was always a sharp reminder for me that he can't just Google these words on a phone or a laptop like the rest of us. In turn, Wayne taught me prison slang, like street people, which means free people like you and me, and inmate.com, which isn't an actual website, but how prisoners informally pass information around the prison through word of mouth. As the holidays approached, he shared the plans he'd made with his friends to make Thanksgiving burritos. This was a strategic choice, because apparently burritos require minimal time in the microwave, which is a hot commodity around the holidays. I'd be using a microwave too, but to make a family favorite, cheese potatoes, and then sitting down with my loved ones for the first time in over a year. For us, missing Thanksgiving together for the first time ever the year before had seemed like a hardship, but Wayne hadn't spent Thanksgiving with his family in decades. As time went on, we started to touch on more serious topics. Although we've never discussed the details of his crime, 
we have talked about the potential for both him and his victim's family to heal. I do feel I am no longer the teenager that committed my crime, he wrote. Heck, I'm no longer the person I became after I was that stupid kid. But have I healed the trauma I caused? With my family, yes. But for everyone else, no. I'm not allowed to reach out to anyone who could be considered a victim of my crime. That act could be traumatizing, so I have to wait for them to come to me. We've also talked about the possibility of him being free again one day. In a recent letter, he wrote, I've been in front of the parole board several times, but apparently haven't served the magic number of years yet. Leading up to a hearing, I run the gamut of emotions. The worst is the fear that my support system will fade away by the time I may actually get released. I wondered if he now counted me as part of that support system. Part of me hoped he didn't because it felt like a responsibility too big to bear, something that should be reserved for only his family. But part of me hoped he did, that he felt I was one more person in his life he could count on. I had come to count on him too. There was one particular day that I was struggling mightily and a letter from Wayne arrived. I'd been living and working alone all day, every day in my apartment for months and had been deprived of human touch for just as long. It had left me feeling completely invisible to the world, like nothing I did mattered. The only human interaction I'd had for several days was a brisk good morning from a stranger out with his dog while I was on a walk. This letter from Wayne arrived shortly after I'd given him feedback on one of his pieces for the first time. Sitting on the couch in my darkened living room, the TV on mute, I peeled open the envelope and carefully unfolded the line notebook paper. In it, he expressed such genuine and overwhelming gratitude for my unexpected appearance in his life and how much he valued me as a person, a writer, and an editor. I must have read that letter half a dozen times and cried my way through it every time. During a period in my life when I felt like I didn't matter to anyone, he reminded me that I did. What first drove me to volunteer for this program was my desire to make someone else feel seen, heard, understood, and valued. I never expected to have Wayne make me feel that way in return, but he has. Earlier this year, Wayne won second place in a contest for incarcerated writers. In his story, he writes, it is not lost on me that every single friendship of mine that has ended all ended the same way, with me sending a letter that never gets a response. Until I read that line, I don't think I truly understood the magnitude of the responsibility I had taken on when I began our correspondence. I had never considered how or when our letters might end or what the consequences could be, especially for him. Wayne's story closes with, if these words are ever read again, maybe I can be more than the worst thing I ever did. Maybe my life can find greater meaning than my crime. If that day ever comes, I'll still be sitting here waiting for a response. I often wonder what the outcome of Wayne's real life story will be. Before I wrote that first letter to him, my biggest fear was that he might get out of prison one day and look for me. Now, that's my biggest hope, that one day we can just be two street people geeking out about writing in a coffee shop, no stamps required. Janelle Drumright, everyone. Janelle.